Well, hello, BookTube. Welcome back to the History Shelf. It's good to be with you. Uh, happy 2022. It's a new year. Um, my name is Peg. I don't think I mentioned that. And uh, this is my History Shelf. There's my little uh, trusty mascot right there, the bookworm, the History Shelf. Today's video um, is a small book haul of sorts, but uh, I'm going to focus it mostly, well, just all of them, actually, on my History Book Club selections. Um, and as many of you know, and if you watched my videos over the last couple of years, I have shared that I'm a member of the History Book Club. Um, it's, it's a direct mail uh, book club, and uh, you can sign up, become a member. Every month, You um, they will uh, give you two credits of uh, book credits. Uh, one book credit is equal to any book up to like a $35 value. And uh, they, they each credit costs $17.49. So it's actually quite, it's definitely a markdown. You know, if there's a new book on the market, that's $29.99. At the History Book Club, you get it for $17.49 in, in the form of a credit. So anyway, um, I've been letting my some of my credits accrue. You know, uh, <clears throat> I don't tend to skip my monthly credits. I'll just pay, it's like $36.00. You know, and then before I know it, I'll go onto the History Book Club website and I find that I've got like four credits I can use on brand new spanking books. So it's quite the deal. I I recommend it if you have the wherewithal or the money to uh, to do that. Um, so I have saved up two shipments for you. That I want to show you some of the recent acquisitions here at the History Shelf that I'm very very excited about. Now, this first book, I have been reading and collecting this man's work. He's a he's an English historian. One of those new age historians that are like young and hip and all tatted up. You know what I'm saying? You know who I'm talking about, right? Stan Jones. Um, this is his brand new book, and I'm so excited. And it's a big chunkster of a book. This is Power and Thrones, A New History of the Middle Ages. Um, and he, you know, his last book was on the Templars, I think. Um, and he's written books on, uh, I have all of them. They're downstairs all on my shelf where I used to broadcast downstairs in front of my white shelves. Um, and I have all of Dan Jones, Dan Jones's books. Um, I'm really excited to read this one. I've been waiting to see when he'd have a, a new one coming out after, um, no, it wasn't the Templars. That was the last one. It was Crusaders, but he's written things like the Plantagenets, the Warrior Kings and Queens Who Made England, The War of the Roses, The Wars of the Roses, The Fall of the Plantagenets, and The Rise of the Tudors. Then he wrote Magna Carta, uh, The Birth of Liberty, The Templars, The Rise and Spectacular Fall of God's Holy Warriors, and then the last one, which was Crusaders, The Epic History of the Wars for the Holy Land. So this one follows on the heels of that. Big old book. So let me go ahead and read to you. Um, and oh, and this is put out by Viking, I should say. I'll, I'll read this to you, if you don't mind. All right. Unhappy Friday, everybody. Uh, when the once mighty city of Rome was sacked by barbarians in 410, it signaled the end of an era and the beginning of a, th of a thousand years of profound transformation in an epic narrative bursting with great characters from St. Augustine uh, and Attila the Hun to the prophet Muhammad and Eleanor of Aquitaine. Dan Jones charges through the history of the Middle Ages and offers a fresh perspective on this rich and complicated age. Powers and Thrones takes readers on a journey through an emerging Europe, the great capitals of late antiquity, as well as the influential cities of the Islamic West, and culminates in the first European voyages to the Americas. The medieval world was forged by the big forces that still occupy us today. Climate change, pandemic disease, mass migration, and technological revolutions. This was the time when the great European nationalities were formed, when the basic Western systems of law and governance were codified. When the Christian churches matured as both powerful institutions and the regulators of public morality. And when art, architecture, philosophical inquiry, and scientific invention went through periods of massive revolutionary change, the West was rebuilt on the ruins of an empire and emerged from a state of crisis and collapse to dominate the world. Every sphere of human life and activity was transformed in the thousand years covered by powers and thrones. As we face a critical turning point in our own millennium, Dan Jones shows that how we got here matters more than ever. I would agree with that. 
History is the greatest teacher, is it not? I've always believed that. Um, lots of nice, uh, at least two, three, sec three sections of uh, color in, um, inserts. Once in the beginning and uh, middle and then in the end of the book. So wonderful. Beautiful book. Um, this, oh, and here's our, here's the, the guy I'm talking about. Just this young, handsome, you know, just, <laughs> this guy's like got tattoos all over him. I've listened to him a lot on the podcast, The History Extra I'm from BBC. Um, he's quite an engaging speaker. Um, he's very passionate about history and, and what he, he writes about. So uh, I highly encourage you to check out any of Dan Jones's work. Um, and check him out on podcasts or YouTube videos. He's a lot of fun. And uh, what was I going to say? Something else about this. Oh, well, I guess I was just going to give you a page count. But um, just tons of, uh, it's, it's amply uh, sourced. It's about 580 pages. So I mean, it's a big one. It's bigger than his last work, for sure. Bigger than the Crusaders. So it's covering a lot. Our handsome Dan Jones is. Um, the next two books I was really pleased to get, um, along with Bill Rutenberg, my friend Bill. <laughs> we are the, uh, probably like the two, two biggest, not, well, not big channels at all, but with like, uh, that I'm aware of that are, uh, you know, really just focusing a lot on history on our channels. And, um, uh, Bill got this book before me, but we were both, um, definitely big fans of H.W. Brands. I have just, I don't have all of his books, but I have a, a quite a, a big assortment downstairs, actually, on the shelf above my Dan Jones. And um, so when I saw this book come across, I had an opportunity to review this for shelf awareness, but I had, my, my plate was full. I had three other books for them to review that month. So it was just, I couldn't squeeze in one more book. But I ended up buying this on my own, and that, this is his latest book, H.W. Brand's Our First Civil War, pa Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. And as you know, Bill Rutenberg is a huge fan of American Revolutionary history. Um, so I, I was not surprised that he got that one. Um, and uh, I just, yeah, so I had ordered it probably around the same time he did, but I just haven't shown it on this channel yet. But it's exciting. I'm not sure when Bill's going to read it. We have two books on the docket to buddy read together. <sighs> I know he's waiting for me to to say I'm ready to start reading Robert E. Lee by Alan Gelso. Um, I just, we're putting the townhome for sale up next week. So it's going back on the market. Uh, life's going to be interesting. Um, and then we could be moving at the end of February. So, uh, and I got a lot of packing to do. I have thousands of books to pack for the movers. <laughs> so we, we shall see. But um, I'm excited for this. Um, I'd like to read a revolutionary history with Bill. That would be fun. But right now we're scheduled to read a Civil War history, you know, a biography on Lee. And then we're going to switch over to World War One and, and, and uh, Buddy read uh, Max Hastings' Catastrophe 1914. So let's read the little in, um, insert here. What causes people to forsake their country and take up arms against it? What prompts their neighbors hardly distinguish, distinguishable in, in station or success to defend that country against the rebels? That is the question H.W. Brand's answers in his powerful new history of the American Revolution. George Washington and Benjamin Franklin were the unlikeliest of rebels. Washington in the 1770s stood at the apex of Virginia society. Franklin was more successful still, having risen from humble origins to world fame. John Adams might have seemed a more obvious candidate for rebellion, being of cantankerous temperament, even so, he revered the law. Yet all three men became rebels against the British Empire that fostered their success. Others in the same circle of family and friends chose differently. William Franklin might have been expected to join his father, Benjamin, in rebellion, but remained loyal to the British. I did not know that. That is fascinating. So did Thomas Hutchinson, a royal governor and friend of the Franklins, and Joseph Galloway, an early challenger to the crown. They soon heard themselves denounced as traitors for not having betrayed the country where they grew up. Native Americans and the enslaved were also forced to choose sides as civil war broke out around them. 
Okay. Uh, After the Revolution, the Patriots were cast as heroes and founding fathers, while the Loyalists were relegated to bit parts best forgotten. Our first Civil War reminds us that before America could win its revolution against Britain, the Patriots had to win a bitter Civil War against family, friends, and neighbors. This is going to be fascinating reading. It kind of takes the history, you know, American Revolutionary history onto uh, more of a um, micro scale instead of the macro and uh, takes it into people's, you know, hearths and homes. And uh, just like with the American Civil Civil War of the 1860s, uh, you know, which was so personal. And in this case, you, we do kind of forget about the loyalists who thought they were being loyal. And how, yeah, how do you define what makes a, a rebel, right? I mean, the Southerners in the American Civil War thought that they were, you know, following the, the example of George Washington. And in a sense, you know, just in a factual sense and in, in a semantic sense, you could say that they were. Um, so it's funny how each generation will redefine what words mean, you know, like rebellion or rebel or, or loyalist, you know. But uh, I like these histories that kind of take it a little bit personal, that take you into like the, you know, biographical and, and get into people's um, relationships with one another. Uh, and it, it, makes it, it makes it more human, makes it a, a more human and humane history. Um, it makes it a little more tangible, you know, when you go micro instead of macro. But um, I'm excited for this. H.W. Brands, so that's the other thing I wanted to mention. I'm, I'm remembering it now, what I wanted to mention about Dan Jones. Both prolific historians. I don't know how they keep pumping out these books. It seems like it's like one every year and a half that they come out with something new. Um, in fact, I think I just, I have another book haul coming from hamiltonbook.com, and I just picked up his last book, <laughs> which I, you know, obviously I have not read yet, about um, the American West. So, and it's a substantial work, and I'm just so curious how these, these historians... And I think, you know, he's a, he's a professor. Now, I don't think Dan Jones teaches, um, so he probably, you know, has more time for this. But I know with H.W. Brands, he is a, um, yeah, he teaches at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, but this guy just keeps pumping them out. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm not complaining. I'm just, I just think it's amazing. So <laughs> keep keep doing what you're doing, my guys. All right, and here's another book. I haven't seen it on Bill's channel yet, but Bill, this, I think you might be interested in this one since you were also, uh, you know, a big American Revolution, uh, you know, fan. Um, so I picked this up with one of my credits from History Book Club. It's a beautiful deco-edged book, but this is, uh, this came out late last year. This is Liberty is Sweet, The Hidden History of, American, of the American Revolution by Woody Holton, who also wrote... Ab- uh, biography on Abigail Adams. This was put out by Simon & Schuster. I should say H.W. Brands' book was put out by Doubleday. Um, It's a beautiful deco-edged book. You could look at that. Nice chunkster. All right. It says here, a sweeping reassessment of the American Revolution, Liberty is Sweet shows how the founding fathers were influenced by the freedom struggles of overlooked Americans, including women, indigenous people, African Americans, and religious dissenters. Woody Holton begins his narrative with the Native Americans, who struggle to save their land, compelling British officials to fortify the frontier, in turn requiring taxes on white colonists that inflame their anger at the mother country. It ends with a brilliant analysis of the economic origins and effects of the U.S. Constitution. Along the way, Holton offers a fresh take on every major battle of the Revolution, from Lexington and Concord to the British surrender at Yorktown and beyond. In his telling, British commanders understood better than their Continental Army counterparts that North America's vast and rugged geography all but guaranteed the rebels a victory, as long as they remained on defense. George Washington wanted to launch an all-out assault on Britain's heavily fortified headquarters in New York, his greatest contribution to the war may have been heeding his subordinates' pleas to restrain his aggressive instincts. Holton shows how commanders' addiction to honor clouded their judgment, how morale considerations influenced tactics, how northern soldiers' fear of tropical disease led them to resist service in the South, and much more. 
Liberty is Sweet is a bottom-to-top account of the American Revolution, integrating for the first time the stories of the famous founders and the marginalized people who understood the phrase, all men are created equal, even better than the man who coined it. Oh, this is interesting. Right at the bottom of this um, uh, text on the flyleaf here, it says, a note on the jacket illustration. The person standing on the left has a secret. Can you spot it? The answer is on pages 402 to 403. The person standing on the left has a secret. Can you spot it? I'm not spotting it. He has a secret. Does he have a knife hidden somewhere? What is he doing? If you guys spot it, let me know in the comments. In my next video, I'll, <laughs> I'll flip to 402 and 403 and find out. That's kind of fun. I've never seen that done in the, in the, in the, uh, the blurb copy, you know, or the, isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, so I'm looking forward to that. I got two books on the American Revolution, a book on the Middle Ages, and I've seen this book a few times on different channels on BookTube, and I, you know, I had to get it. Um, this is a history of the library. Beautiful cover book. Oh, I could just look at that all day. It's The Library of Fragile History by Andrew Pettigree and Arthur Der Veduven. Der Veduven. I'm, I'm, I'm doing the German pronunciation of W, right, with the V sound. Veduven. I hope that's right. This is put out by Basic Books. This came out late last year. Famed across the known world, jealously guarded by private collectors, built up over centuries, destroyed in a single day, ornamented with gold leaf and frescoes, or filled with beanbags and children's drawings, the history of the library is rich, varied, and stuffed full of incident. In the library, the first major work of its kind, historians Andrew Pedigree and Arthur Der Veduven trust Trust, trace this extraordinary history from the famous collections of the ancient world to the embattled public resources we cherish today. Along the way, they introduce us to the antiquarians and philanthropists who shape the world's great collections, trace the rise and fall of technologies, ideologies, and tastes, and reveal the high crimes and misdemeanors committed in pursuit of rare <clears throat> and valuable manuscripts. Very often, they find libraries flourish in the hands of their first owner, then waste away as collections that represented the values and interests of one generation fail to speak to the ones that follow. Mm -hmm. Yet while collections themselves fall victim to damp, dust, moths, and bookworms, ew, the idea of the library persists as each generation makes and remakes the, the institution anew. All right. Those are our authors right there. So a decent little history on the uh, libraries. Can't go wrong. It kind of reminds me of the Nicholas um, Basbane's books um, that he writes about just bibliophiles and biblio bibliophilia and things like that. Um, this will kind of just talk about the role of libraries. And I'm curious to see how they do talk about them today and what they represent today. And it's interesting, too, when they talk about um, how a collection thrives under its first owner and then just kind of just fritters away or kind of disappears as succeeding generations go through it, um, which leads me to a morbid thought. <laughs> but I'm curious to know with my bookish friends out there who have vast libraries, if any of you are watching and care to share what your, what, what are your plans for after like, well, knowing that we are all going to shuffle off this mortal coil at some point, I've often thought, like, I want to have something in place that makes it easier for my loved ones who are left with all of this to deal with. <laughs> um, what should I do? You know, what, what plan should I make for my library? And um, at this point, you know, I would love some, some insights or uh, suggestions. I've just been thinking about, like, finding like a small town library somewhere that really needs an influx of stock. 
um, uh, like I would like to donate my books, like after my death. Of course, my family could get first dibs on everything, um, and friends. But I would really like to know that they are not just being thrown out or dumped off at the goodwill, where they probably will not. A lot of this stuff is so uh, arcane or not all of it, but there's some that's just like, you know, it really, it took some money to acquire these and I'd like to see them in a, in a, you know, a worthy place. I know with my Christian commentaries and uh, things I've acquired from InterVarsity Press, um, I'd like to actually have those donated to like a reading room at a local church, um, give them to you know, some pastoral organizations. I'm sure pastors could make use of the, um, some of the more um, theological in the, you know, biblical studies that I, that I possess, that they could use those. So but I'm just curious what, to, what your ideas are about your own collection. And, and what do you think you'd like to do with yours, physical collection? I know a lot of people have a lot of eBooks today, so that's not something you need to worry about. But boy, for those of us who really do <laughs> have thousands of books, I do want to make this as easy as possible. If I were to suddenly die, I just would just, not that I'm going to feel anything really here <laughs> on this earth, but I'd be like, damn, man, they just had to deal with having to do something with all these books, you know? Anyway. I know, right? Why am I even thinking about that? But you know, I, some, I do sometimes, you know? I'm just like, well, where are these guys going to go? Final book from my history book club uh, orders from the last two months. Um, this is a brand new history on Soviet Russia, Soviet Union. I uh, did not know it was coming. So, I mean, I, I saw when they it was coming on the, like, coming soon on the history book club website. But I was like, I had not heard any buzz about this book. And it's a Yale University Press release. Um, but you know me. In my Soviet studies, in Russia studies, I had to have it. It says, Collapse of the, uh, well, what is this? Got a little bit of a, Collapse, it's called Collapse, sorry. The subtitle is, a. they probably should have made Collapse a bigger font, because it looks all like one big long word. <laughs> collapse, The Fall of the Soviet Union by Va Vladislav Zubak. Um, oh, William Taubman, Will William Taubman wrote the, I think, is it a two volume or a one volume? One volume biography on this guy right here, um, Gorbachev. And he also wrote the Khrushchev biography, which I have both, of course. Uh, so yeah, The Fall of the Soviet Union, a Yale University press. Look at nice spine cover there. The picture comes all the way up. Well, they kind of imprint his face right there. Um, let's go ahead and see what this, how this one's going to tackle that. A groundbreaking reassessment of the collapse of the Soviet Union, showing how Gorbachev's reforms, although much championed in the West, led to its ultimate demise. In 1991, the Soviet Union had an army 4 million strong, 5,000 nuclear-tipped missiles, and was the second biggest producer of oil in the world. But at the end of that year, the Union sank into an economic crisis and was torn apart by nationalist separatism. Its collapse was one of the seismic shifts of the 20th century. Three decades on, Vladislav Zubak offers a major reinterpretation of the final years of the USSR, refuting the notion that the breakup of the Soviet Union was inevitable. Instead, Zubak reveals how Gorbachev's idealistic but hastily implemented policies intended to modernize and democratize the Soviet Union, deprived the government of resources, and encouraged separatism. Collapse sheds new light on Russian democratic populism the role of the West, the crisis of Soviet finances, and the fragility of, author of authoritarian state power. Okay. Um, that's well footnoted. It's got a lot of good stuff in here. We've got, it's about 450 pa 440 pages. And then between notes, another 100 pages of notes and bibliography, maybe a little bit more than 100 pages. So um, I am curious to see how he makes this case. Uh, yeah, whenever you try to introduce any type of, well, you see, you know, China has introduced modernization and a little bit of a market 
um, democratic, you know, free market principles. But you're not getting any type of uh, hints of any type of separatism or, you know, uprisings, except in like, you know, you know, well, Hong Kong and stuff like that. But, but then again, I think the Chinese have instituted things more slowly. So maybe that's the case he's making here is what it says in the beginning is that he tried to, to make it happen very quickly. He hastily implemented these policies. Um, but I mean, we'll see. I think it was, I think in all cases, communism, you know, hangs itself. Um, still waiting to see how that's going to uh, happen in China. Um, they're mixing and matching, which I think is going to lend some longevity. Uh, you know, mixing and matching um, market, uh, free market principles. They've kind of, you know, took the, the, the foot off the neck of um, some of the businesses there and stuff. And so, you know, and people are, are happy. They seem to be happy, but, you know, you really still don't have freedom of speech. You can't really criticize the government without any type of repercussion. So we'll see how long it lasts in China. I don't, I don't think I'll be alive to see anything happen there. But as far as anything changing, you know, um, them becoming more liberal or more of a democratic state, I don't see it happening. Anyway, so... Let's see if I can, I don't think I, well, maybe I can do a pyramid. Pyramid. We have Collapse, the Fall of the Soviet Union by Vladislav Zubok. We have the history of the library, a fragile history. We've got Liberty is Sweet by Woody Holton. H.W. Brands, our first civil war. And then Dan Jones, Power. Uh, Power and Thrones, New History of the Middle Ages. So let's see here. These are, and these are all big books from History Book Club. And I got them all for basically a song. I mean, seventeen fifty for each, but you know what? I kind of let my credits accrue. So let me know what you guys like out of the stack. Whoa, there we go. And, uh, Wow, that took up a lot of space. <laughs> yeah, let me know what you think. And um, happy 2022, happy new year. And uh, we are chugging along here. We got some snow the other day. We got it twice, the day after the wildfires. Um, and freezing temperatures, so it's basically just very brutally cold. But I think today it's warming up, but we did get some snow uh, the day before yesterday. And uh, so we got some snow on the ground. Still need a ton more to, to moisturize this land that is very dry. But we'll take what we can get. All right, BookTube, I will be uploading another video very soon. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you for watching. Thanks for all the new um, likes and subscribers and comments. I've really been enjoying talking to you guys in the comments. And you've all been so wonderful and supportive of... Uh, just of me and this channel, and, uh, you know, we've had some rough endings to this year. Um, but we, I appreciate all the well wishes. You guys are really kind people, and I really appreciate you being along on this journey. So until next time, BookTube, have a fabulous Friday. Have a great weekend. We'll talk soon.